Bwana Yesu asifiwe and a very warm welcome this beautiful afternoon. We are so glad that you have chosen to be part of us. Today we are having candid conversations with Susan Gishuru, the CEO of Legacy Hub KE. Today we are focusing on matters finance. Yes, she is a personal finance coach. You can find her on Instagram and on Facebook. Her social media platforms are as on the screen. But before I say so much, nani kama sijui nyingi sana, we're going to invite Susan to take us through the next session. Stay blessed. Hi everyone, welcome to today's session. I'm very glad to have you here. Thank you so much for tuning in. Um, in today's session, we are going to be focusing on money and my mission. My name is Susan Wanjiko. I am the founder and the CEO of the Legacy Hub Kenya, which is your one-stop platform for all things personal finance, um, self-development, and um, financial freedom. So in today's session, we are going to be talking about my mission and money as a believer. Now, when we talk about mission, um, what we mean, what exactly do we mean by mission? As a Christian, do you know what your mission is and do you know how to handle money or how to use money as a resource or an equipment for you to be able to achieve your mission? Now, a mission is an important assignment given to a person or a group of people um, and mostly it is used like in military terms when people are told to go a certain place to achieve a certain mission then they are able to come back. And so um, given our theme Philippians 3 13 to 14 we definitely need to start with the word and this is what it says because this is where our mission is as Christians. So Philippians 3 13 to 14 it says um, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead. Verse 14, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenwards in Christ Jesus. Now, looking at that scripture, we notice quite a number of things. The first thing we notice is forgetting the past. And I find it interesting that Paul focuses on forgetting the past. And I believe that he, fo he, to he tells us to forget the past because he wants us to be content with the present and to be able to reach forward. Now, it is quite important that as a Christian, as you are thinking about your mission, you want to forget the past. And this is why that is important. Most of us tend to use our past as the reason why we cannot move forward. Most of us tend to use the, our past pains, our, ma our past mistakes as the reason why we cannot be able to march forward and to achieve the mission that God has called us to be. Now, Paul urges us to forget the past. Paul urges us to forget the things that have, we ha the mistakes that we have made before, the failures that we have encountered before. He calls us to forget everything that causes us to feel a certain type of way to a point that we are not able to achieve the mission or, or the purpose that God has, you know, sent us on earth to do. And so as you are watching and listening to me today, I want you to just take this moment and think about any self-limiting belief that you have for or, or, uh, about yourself. So you find that some people will be like, oh, I never came from this family, so I cannot be this thing. I never got this type of education, so I cannot achieve this thing. But really, looking at Bible heroes and the people that really um, stand out in scripture, there were people who had not so very impressive past. And that's the God we serve. He's the one that can take anyone and anything. And with that Jesus factor in you, you are able to be um, you are able to be equipped to achieve the mission that God has given you. And so that is the first thing we start with. When you are thinking about your mission, when you're thinking about the things that God has called you to do, your past is not one thing you want to consider. And if at all you're considering your past, you want to use it as fuel as opposed to using it as a stumbling block or as an obstacle or as a reason why you cannot be able to move forward to the mission that God has called you to do. And as believers, I mean, we have two core missions, the overall core missions and where we should focus all our attention. Number one, that is the great commission. We have been called as believers in everything and in anything that we do, whether it is in the church, whether it is in your personal life or in the marketplace, we have been called to make disciples. 
that is where it all starts. Regardless of what you do in life, regardless of where, which area your mission lies in, we have been called to make disciples. So make disciples in the corporate place. As you are doing your music, make disciples there. As you are teaching, make disciples there. As you are selling merchandise and selling, you know, foodstuffs, whatever it is that God has called you to do, when it comes to mission, the core reason why we do what we do is so that Jesus can be seen in our lives and in our mission. So that is the first, the first big mission, the overall mission that everything else falls under, making disciples. The second mission that we have been called to is to get to the point where we enter heaven and we hear him say, welcome, good and faithful servant. Now, as we look to verse 14, still on our theme, it says, I press on towards the goal to win the price for which God has called me heavenwards in Christ Jesus. So what is this goal? The goal is to hear him say, welcome, good and faithful um, servant. Now, at this moment, we want to talk about, um, you know, what, what, is this, what is this goal that we are working towards and how can we get there? Because Paul is specific about pressing towards the goal. Let me, um, one of the things that you're going to realize is that if anything is easy, then you won't have to press forward. If anything is um, very easily doable, then you don't have to put in any effort. But pressing takes effort. Pressing will need you to call, you know, to master some strength in order to be able to do it. So that tells you that in order for you to be able to accomplish the mission that God has called you to do, you will have to master some courage. You will have to master some strength. You will have to master some discipline because that is what it takes to press towards, to press towards anything. And therefore, we as believers, we are pressing towards the goal. Other than just pressing towards achieving our mission, we have said that the ultimate goal is to hear him say, good and faithful. Uh, welcome home, good and faithful steward. And therefore, one of the things you're going to notice is that the more you do, the more you get into your mission, the more you start doing what God has called you to do, the more it's going to require you to be actively present in that thing. And so you will realize that the fitter you grow for heaven, the faster you, you want to press towards it. Okay? And so some people start, um, and, and this is why I think uh, Paul emphasizes really on pressing, because it's very easy to start what God has told you to start and to start what God is calling you to do, but finishing it and getting to the final prize is a problem. And you're going to realize that the more that you do it, you will encounter challenges, you will encounter obstacles. And so as a believer, you want to be able to know that the fitter you're going to get for heaven, because each and every day that we make one step closer to becoming who God has called us to be, to achieving the mission that God has put us here on earth to do, we become fitter, we become fitter for heaven. And so this is an encouragement. This is one of the reasons why you want to take your mission seriously here on earth, because it makes you fitter for heaven every day. And the fitter you get the more you run towards heaven even as a believer and now Paul also says that we are pressing towards a higher calling let me tell you something a Christian's calling is a high calling and why is it a high calling because it is from heaven I know majority of us probably do not have haven't gotten to a point of identifying exactly what God called you here on earth to do and that is fine. In fact, if you are watching me right now and you still don't know what your purpose here on uh, on earth is, you still are identifying what your passions and you you know and the things you love to do are and further to that you're still trying to figure out, I mean, what am I here for? What is my mission? I want, you to, I want you to just know that it is okay to not have it all figured out. Everyone who has identified their mission, they have gone through a struggle. They have gone through a struggle of identity. And that is one of the things um, that we need to prioritize as believers. One of the things that I've come to realize is that majority of us, and especially as young people, we don't spend enough time with ourselves to know exactly what makes our heart beat to know what makes you tick. So this is a trick I want to give you. Spend time with yourself and, and, and just try and identify what is the one thing that I do so naturally. Further to that question, um, could I do this thing without pay? 
you know, can, do I picture myself, you know, do I picture myself doing this thing for the rest of my life? Another question that you want to ask yourself in a bid to understand your passions, your purpose, the, maybe even the mission that God has put you here on earth to do, is to ask yourself, what is the one thing that bothers me? When you look at DCIK, the church, or the church that you go to, I mean, Ukiona Wato Wako in the worship team, and they're like, okay, uh, and you're like, okay, I think this could change. I wish they could do better. Instead of looking for someone to do what you, is bothering you, why don't you become that someone and actually do it? So you'll realize that some of the things that bother you, either um, on TV, either in your church, in your workplace, that is probably where your purpose lies. The things that you do naturally, the things that bother you, the things that agitate you, God has put you here on earth to create solutions and to make that thing better. So what one of the things that is one of the ways of identifying what your passion and purpose is. Another thing I want to also encourage us as young people, spend um, one of the reasons why we are we live in an age of distractions. So we are you're either on your phone texting people or you're on social media or you're watching movies we 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 kind of don't spend enough time with ourselves to be able to know what exactly you know to listen to the inner meditations of our hearts and to know this this is honestly what i like this is what i enjoy doing majority of us think we we love what we love because we've been told oh this thing is nice this thing sells, or rather this, this, this title or this kind of job comes with this accolades, but you haven't really sat with yourself long enough to, be, to identify, okay, this is legit what I love doing. This is legit what I feel God is putting me here on earth. So spend enough time with yourself, alone time, okay? trying to figure out and just listening to the inner vibrations of your heart, listening to what God is telling you, listening to the, you know, to the... Um, in, pressing of the Holy Spirit on some of these aspects and you're going to end up um, knowing what you are here for. Another thing, consult the master. Consult the one who made you. There is a manual. This is the manual that we came with. And as you interact with God's word, as you give yourself enough time to allow the Lord to talk to you, to minister to you, to show you who you are, because our identity only comes from God, not from the things we have, not from the family that we came from, not from the money we have or the accolades that we have. Our identity comes from God. And so that is where... As an individual, you should be seeking your identity from. And once you find your identity in Christ, I mean, it's going to be just a matter of time before you identify what your purpose is. So this is, and once you identify your purpose, you are able to immediately know this is what I'm here to do. This is what I've been called to do. And if you know me long enough, you know I keep telling people, once you identify your mission, one of the things I'm going to kid you not is that your mission is bigger than you. Remember, our calling is a higher calling so it's from heaven and there's nothing about heaven that is modest okay there's nothing about heaven that is modest and so majority of us have gotten to a point where you have gotten a glimpse of what God is calling you to do and it scares you and you stop so I want to tell you that it is okay for you to be scared by what you feel like God is calling you to do. And it, it is not your expertise or your background that qualifies you for your higher calling. It is God that qualifies you. Amen? And so it is important for you to not let fear um, be, you know, the thing that stops you from achieving your mission in life. Now, let me give you a, another trick I use. Now, anytime I want to do something... And there is a spirit of fear attached to it. I know that is exactly what I should be doing. And let me tell you why. Because scripture tells us that God has not given us a spirit of fear. And so I know that that fear did not come from God. He has given us a spirit of love, of power, and of a sound mind. And so if I'm trying to do something, if I'm trying to start my music, or start my art, or mentor these people, or to do this one thing or the other, and there is a spirit of fear attached to it, let me tell you, I run towards that thing because I know fear doesn't come from the from the Lord fear comes from the enemy and so if the enemy is trying to attach fear to what it is that I am doing I know I need to be doing that thing because he comes to steal kill and destroy he wants to steal your mission he wants to steal your purpose he wants to steal the you know the the, the crown that will come with achieving what God has called you here to do and so don't be afraid and even if you are afraid 
do it afraid. Because fear doesn't come from God. And so that is one of the ways that you know. So some people tend to kind of deter from, you know, they take detours and they're like, okay, I don't think I'm supposed to be doing this thing because I'm so afraid. I, I, I don't have this figured out. I don't have this other thing figured out. Let me tell you something. If there is a spirit of fear attached to what you are, what you feel you should be doing, then you need to do it afraid. Because God hasn't given you a spirit of fear. You know it's from the enemy. And if he's trying to attach a spirit of fear, then you already know he doesn't want you to do that thing. And if the devil doesn't want you to do that, that thing, my brother, my sister, you ought to be doing it. Because that is where your purpose lies. That is where your crown of life and the crown of glory also lies. Now, I want us to um, look at money. Because one of the things you're going to realize is that it is impossible for you to achieve your mission in life without money. And why do I say this? Money is a device of empowerment to make decisions. All right? Money is a device of empowerment to make decisions. One of the reasons why the world is dominant in the generation that we are living in, one of the reasons why secularism is dominant in the world that we are living is because the secular world has the money and the resources to push their agendas. The secular world has the money and the resources to push for their agendas. And so you will find that no matter how much um, noise the church makes, then it is impossible for us to be able to push some of these agendas to the extent that they need to be pushed to because we don't have the resource that is money. Now, one of the things that I want to clarify as we are talking about money, because in fact, I want you to just take this moment and, and just answer this question to yourself. When you think of money, the moment I mentioned money right now, what did you feel? I know some of us were like, okay, are we talking about money? And others were, you know, what, what do you feel when money is mentioned as a believer? Because we have people that are called money monks that tend to think that money is evil, right? They tend to think that money stands in the way of a believer and their work with God. And we have other Christians that are quite interesting that are just afraid of the conversation with money. Why? Because we don't feel like we are equipped to be having conversations about money. Now, one of the things I'm going to tell you is that after... A, a, after a relationship with the Holy Spirit and, and knowing the word of God and fellowshipping with believers, in order for you to be an effective Christian, you cannot avoid the conversation on money. We cannot avoid the conversation on money. And um, I want us to look at a scripture in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10, because we have quite a number of people who think money is the root of all evil. Now, let's clarify. Is money really the root of all evil? We are going to be looking at 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10. If you have your Bible, turn to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10. And 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 10 says, For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Another rendition in the message translation says, Lust for money brings trouble and nothing but trouble. Going down that path, some lose in their footing, in their faith completely, and live to regret it bitterly even after. Now, the Amplified Version says, For the love of money is a root of all evils. It is through this craving that some have led astray, and they have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves through with many acute mental pangs. Now, as you are listening to that scripture, I hope you can realize that money is not the root of all evil. Scripture says that the love of money is the root of all evil. The lust of money is the root of all evil. And, 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 in, this, and in this particular chapter, actually, Timothy says that the love of money that causes you to wander from the faith, the love of money that causes you to ditch what you know about God and to start doing your own thing, that is the root of all evil. But money by itself is not the root of all evil. As a matter of fact, money is a device of empowerment, even in the kingdom. And I want to prove that um, as we look at the Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 19. 
Ecclesiastes chapter Ecclesiastes chapter 10 verse 19 and in the New King James Version it says a feast is made for laughter and wine makes merry but money answereth all things let me repeat that a feast is made for laughter and wine and merry and wine makes merry but money answereth everything now if you are listening to us carefully this is scripture and it says money answereth everything. And so if money answereth everything, then money cannot be the root of all evil. Money indeed, the love of money is indeed the root of all evil. And so as Christians, this is one of the mental, um, you know, the paradigm shifts that we, may, we need to make. I keep telling people that it is God's desire for you to make a whole lot of money. And I mean a whole lot of money. There is actually nothing about the kingdom of God that is modest. There is nothing about the kingdom of God that is anti-abundant. Okay, And so Christ came so that we can have life and have it in abundance. And the book of Peter also tells us that we have been given all things that pertain to life and to godliness. So God knew. There's a reason why it doesn't just say that you have been given everything for, for godliness only. It says you have been given everything that pertains to life and for godliness. So God knows that you will need to do life. And for you to be able to do life, then you will need money. And so money answereth everything. And money is not the root of all evil. And therefore, the love of money, uh, the love of money is what is the root of all evil. Now... As a believer, what are some of the things that you need to um, have in mind when it comes to money? And this is, you see, we are expected to be faithful stewards. And therefore, it, the same way you're learning about faith, the same way we've been learning about everything that is going to equip us for godliness, we need to understand money as believers for us to be able to be effective key, effective soldiers in the kingdom and for us to be able to achieve our mission. Now, the first thing that we need to do with regard to money as believers, we need to master the basics of money. And why I say we need to master the basics of money is because you can't excel in what you don't understand. If you don't understand money, you cannot excel in money. If you don't understand faith, you cannot excel in your walk in faith. If you don't understand relationship with the Holy Spirit, you cannot excel in your relationship with the Holy Spirit. And so because we need to excel in money, and we have said the reason why we want to excel in money is because we want to be equipped as soldiers in the kingdom to be able to push the agenda of the kingdom into the world and so if we are to do that effectively we need to understand this tool because now our mindset has changed money is no longer evil money is a tool it is a resource and so we need to master the basics of money and this calls for there is a place of faithful stewardship when it comes to money and let me just tarry there for a while when we talk about faithfulness when it comes to money as a believer we know do you do you give when it comes to like to the kingdom of God, are you giving towards the work of the Lord? Are you faithfully tithing? Are you paying your tithes and your offerings? Because that is where good stewardship starts. With the little that you have, with the little that God has, with the little or even much that the Lord has blessed you with, are you a faithful steward? And stewardship doesn't just come in form of tithing and giving offerings, although that is the most important bit as a believer. Because again, we have said, this is my mission and money. My mission, we said that it overall it is to bring, you know, glory to God, to bring, to win souls for the kingdom of God and to hear him say, welcome, good and faithful servant. And so it starts by supporting the work of God. And so today I just want to encourage you, if you are there and you, you intend on being a faithful steward with what God has given you, purpose to give towards the work of God, purpose to, to pay your tithes, to give your offerings, to support missions because God sees a cheerful giver and wherever it is, and, and he's the one that gives. And so why would we withhold what God has given us from God himself? Amen. So that there is a place of good stewardship. Now, still under good stewardship, the Lord expects you to be able to know, you know, understand money. Don't just waste. We can't. Let me tell you something. As a believer, you cannot just walk around like a commoner. We are not commoners. We are, we are soldiers on duty on a day-to-day -day basis. So Monday to Sunday, you are a soldier on duty. Monday to Sunday, you are on duty. And so as a person who's on duty in the kingdom of God, you cannot, you know, 
I mean, do you ever see a soldier just walking around without his armory, you know, without uh, or even a cop? without his gun, without everything that he needs to be able to execute. Now, I want you to think of money as such. Money is part of your armor as a, as a, as, um, as a soldier in the army of God, as someone who's trying to push the agenda, as an ambassador of the kingdom. Money is a tool. So you can't just walk around being careless with your money. You know, you can't be living above your means. And, and, and let, me just, let me just address this. We have so many Christians that come to church. And every Sunday we are raising our hands, praying and fasting. And we are like, I receive. I receive, I receive. But that's all we do. All we do is receive. And that's why we have so many believers. I am so sick and tired of seeing believers that are poor. There is nothing about our God that is poor. There is nothing about our God that is anti-abundant. And so other, on top of just coming, and I'm not saying that coming to church and receiving the word is a problem. What I, I, I'm saying is a problem is coming to church, receiving and going home and doing nothing. Going home and not learning how to budget. Going home and not learning how to spend your money. Going home and still living way above your means. Going home and getting into debt to finance your lifestyle. I mean, that needs to change. It is not faithful stewardship if you're blowing your money away with, without any careful thought to what you're doing. It is not faithful stewardship for believers to be walking around not knowing, you know, where their money is going, tracking their money. It, it, is, it is not faithful stewardship for believers to be, you know, you have a Tala loan, an Emshuari loan, you have a branch loan, and then you, I mean... That is not faithful stewardship. So you, you can't take all the loans during the week and then you come on, uh, on Sunday and you're like, I receive. What exactly? I, in, in fact, I declare and decree that when the next time you receive, I pray that you will receive wisdom and guide us to know how to best manage your money. I pray that you're going to receive the, you know, the, the, the courage and the discipline to know what to do. And not just to know what to do, but to actually do it. Because we live in an information age and so we all know what to do about our money. We all know we need to save. We all know we need to tithe. We all know we need to live within our means. But now I pray and my desire is that God is going to enable us and to equip us to be able to do what we already know we should be doing. Now, the second thing, God expects you to do something with the little that you have. If you look at the parable of the talents, there was one that had five, others, another one had two, and another one had one. But God didn't just expect that the person who had much, which is in this case, if we were to put it in millions, we'd say that one had five million, the other one two million, and the other one had one million. But the one with five million was expected to do much with his money, same way with the one who had one million. And so we have a lot of Christians walking around like, but I can't do anything with what I have. You know, I only, ha I only earn 20,000 or I only earn 10,000. Let me tell you, it is never about what you are earning or what you have. It's always about what you do with what you have. So are you faithful with the little such that when God blesses you with much, then you're going to be faithful with it? And one thing I can tell you is that if you're not faithful with the little, you will not be faithful with much. And so we need, we need to be good stewards and we need to be faithful. Now, God also desires effectiveness when it comes to money. And I think I've already pointed out on this, that the, the world is able to push their agendas because they can fund them. And so Christians should aim for kingdom wealth. Yes, I have said it and I will repeat it. Christians should aim for kingdom wealth. And why are we, we, um, why are we aiming for kingdom wealth? This is, this is because we need to be effective in pushing kingdom agenda. We need to aim for wealth, not so that we can stand, not so that we can, we can get all the things that we want in life. Our, our goal is different as believers. Uh, remember, our calling is higher. It is heavenwards. And therefore, as a believer, I'm pushing for kingdom wealth. I'm working hard at my job. I'm working hard at my business. I'm learning all things that I need to, to learn with regards to managing my money, running my business, you know, going to school and getting that education. Let me tell you, if you focus on the things of the kingdom, if you focus on the things of the kingdom, all these things will be added unto you. And so even as a, as a believer, don't just aim for money so that you can drive the best cars. Don't just aim for money so that you can live a, be, a good life. And let me tell you, that is important. I, I, 
I, I mean, I cannot overemphasize how important it is for us to represent Christ as an abundant God because he is an abundant God. And so, yes, we need to, yes, we need to live an abundant life, but the ultimate goal is different. Let me tell you, we need to be aiming to become millionaires because I need to sit in a boardroom table and to command some respect. I'm aiming for kingdom wealth because I need to enter into meetings and command respect, not as an individual, but as an ambassador of Christ. And that is why it is important. That is why we cannot ignore the money conversation in the church no more. That is why we cannot continue mismanaging the money in churches no more. That is why we cannot continue ignoring the role of personal finance in the church no more because we need to command respect in the world. So imagine walking into a room and coming with the backing of of the end i mean heaven is backing you up you have the holy spirit you are under the mentorship of the holy spirit and guess what you have the money to command some respect we are going to be able to push kingdom agendas in that way and therefore this is one of the things that god requires with us with regard to money he desires that we become effective believers and the only way we are going to be effective christians and effective ambassadors of the kingdom of god is by understanding money as i've said being faithful stewards and then aiming for kingdom wealth in order to be able to push kingdom agendas. Now, as I finish up, there, as again, I said we need to all be advocates of kingdom wealth. So I talk about money a lot, and I keep encouraging people. And even if there is a parent that is watching me here, this is one of the things that we need to normalize in our homes. We need to be able to talk about money in our homes. We need to be able to talk about money to our children so that they are not growing up thinking that, you know, money is just a conversation that parents have. I've seen a lot of young people who are who are mentored by their parents from an early age and they, they have been able to save early, they've been able to understand the saving culture early, which means they've been able to invest and ultimately they end up being, you know, young adults that are very well put together. And so if you are a parent, you need to normalize having the money conversation. And as young people, I keep telling people that if the circle, if the friends you have, if you don't talk about money, you people are wasting time. There needs, to have, there needs to be a culture of having money conversations around our circles as girls, you know. And, and, and that is why one of the reasons I, I really love seeing young women doing chamas because for a very long time we thought chamas are for our mama. You know, when you hear your mom saying, I mean, that chama, you don't really understand. But I, I've, I've seen a lot of young people come up with investment groups, come up with chamas, and they are able to do so much together. And so we need to normalize having the money conversation in church. Remember, not because money is evil, but because money is a tool. Not because money is, is going to get in the way of my relationship with God, but because money is a resource that I can use to further the mission that God has called me here on earth to do. Now, one of the things that we also need to look at, when you're thinking about money and your mission, how do you marry the two? We've talked, about, um, we've talked about your mission and how to identify your mission. We've talked about money. We have clarified that money is not the root of all evil. Money answereth all things. Money is a tool. The love of money is the root of all evil. And let me, and let me tell you something. If we allow the Lord to guide us, if you have the right goal for money, you will never lose sight. And that is one of the reasons we, we need to ask the Lord to to work on our hearts, we need to ask the Lord to really, um, to really purge our hearts so that we have the right reasons why we want money. And we said that as believers, the reason why we want to have kingdom wealth is because we want to further kingdom agenda. And so as long as you keep your eye on the price, as long as you keep your eyes fixed on that moment that he will say, welcome good and faithful servant, then you will never lose sight. Money will never take the place of God if you have the right reason why you want money. And so when you're looking at your mission, when you're looking at your money, now we need to match those two and understand. Now, okay, Susan, we've talked about my mission. You've told me this is what, no, this is what I need to do to identify what God is calling me here to do. And as a recap, we've said, it's never that complicated, guys. It's never that complicated. Let me, let me give you an example. For the longest time, I never thought I had the talent. I never knew 
other than singing and I can't sing that well either way like not not professionally right and so there was a time I thought um you know, singing is not my thing, so what is my... And for the longest time, I thought I do not have a talent. And the more I've grown up, the more I've fellowshiped with the Lord, the more I've gotten mentors who have interacted with me. Let me shock you. My talent is talking, guys. I just yap. I can talk from today to Timbuktu. I can just talk morning to evening and not get, you know, tired. And that's it. So my, my, my talent is not so deep. It's not very... I mean, no accolade. There's no degree of talking. But... When there is a Jesus factor on the small thing that you do very naturally, everything changes. Now I make a living talking to people. Now I coach people on money. Now I train people on investing. That's what I do. It's not because I w I'm very skilled at this thing, but it's because of the Jesus factor. And so don't feel like you need to have a very a very glorified talent, a very glorified gifting. For some people, it is personal interaction with people. For some people, they connect better with people. And so it's never that complicated. When the thing that you do most naturally, the thing that you can do even uh, while you're sleeping, the thing that you can do without getting tired, the thing that you can do without getting paid, I keep saying that where your passion is, that's the thing that you do naturally or the thing that makes you tick, is probably where your purpose and your mission is. And where your purpose and your mission lies, your money lies there as well. I assure you, where your passion is, your purpose and your mission lies there. And where your purpose and your mission lie, your money lies there. So don't, it's never that complicated, guys. Now, I want us to look at Psalms 144 as we close up. And to see, now, how do I marry my mission and money? Psalm 144 verse 1. It says, Blessed be the Lord my rock, who trains my hands for war, and my fingers for battle. I love this. Blessed be the Lord my rock, who trains my hand for war, and my fingers for battle. Hold that thought and let's quickly rush to Isaiah 48. Isaiah 48, 17. Isaiah 48, 17 in the New King James Version says, Thus the Lord, thus says the Lord your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. I am the Lord your God who teaches you how to profit, who leads you by the way that you should go. Now, every time I talk about money and mission, one of the things that people ignore is the power and the place of God when it comes to profiting from your mission or, you know, making wealth and making money and profiting. The word of God, let me tell you something. God will equip you for everything. Again, Peter has said he has given us all things pertaining to life and for godliness. And so the Lord will equip you. He will train your hands for what he has called you to do. The Lord will train your hands for battle. He will equip you for war. He will teach you how to profit. He will teach you how to make the kingdom wealth that we are talking about. The Lord will show you in the way that you should go. And so many people ask me, you know, what has been your business strategy? What do you do in order for you to be able to, you know, to understand your mission, your purpose, to be able to use money, to be able to further that agenda? And let me tell you guys, there is no better business strategy than neology. Getting on your knees and actually actually inquiring from the Lord. And so it is a business strategy. Maybe the world may see it as foolishness, but in the kingdom we know how important it is. The, the wisdom of the world can never measure up to the wisdom of God. The ways of the world can never measure up to the way, to, 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 I mean the ways of the world can never measure up to the ways of God. And so this is what I, I as, as a close-up, I, I, I know there are many of us who are just wondering, okay, so how do I start from here? I know this is what I'm called to. I know I don't even have the necessary uh, resources with regards to money to start. I'll tell you these two things. Think big but start small and start now. There's always something that you can start with. When I started my company, I only had my phone and my big mouth. Again, I told you I can talk, right? 
and I and I talked and I talked and I talked. I didn't need capital to talk. I didn't need capital to shoot my videos. And the more I did that, the more I established myself as a thought leader in the area of finance, the Lord started bringing me clients. The Lord started bringing me people who were asking me, okay, I've watched your videos. I heard what you said about um, investing, but can I get a more personalized thing? And that, that, that has nothing to do with me. I've never even owned that. That, that has everything to do with God and the, power, and, the, and, and the power of the Jesus factor in your life. So I want to encourage you today. Think big, but start small and start now. And always remember that the Lord will, he will equip your hands for battle. He will equip you for that war. He will teach you how to prosper. He will show you the way to go. All we need to do is to surrender. All we need to do is to allow him, even in that sensitive area of our lives, money. And we need to be able to equip ourselves. I keep telling people, being a believer is not an excuse not to be educated. It's not an excuse not to know. And so as believers, I'm challenging you. As we finish, as, you know, as we are doing this conference, as you're being empowered, I challenge you to purpose to empower yourself this year. I challenge you to take a class, a free class online. I challenge you to start having money conversations with your Bible study group. I challenge you to start having money conversations with your family. I challenge you to start asking, where do I want to see myself in the next five to ten years as an equipped kingdom ambassador, as a wealthy kingdom ambassador? And let me tell you, God is going to do it. God is going to do it for you because he's no man that he should lie, neither should he change his mind. I hope this has been helpful for you guys. Um, if you have any questions, just be sending them in the comments. I'm sure they're going to, you're going to get some responses. And um, let's keep talking about this money conversation. Now, we can just pray and wrap this up in Jesus' name. So, Heavenly Father, we want to thank you. Thank you for your word today. Thank you for what you have taught us about our mission. We pray in the name of Jesus that you're going to release your Holy Spirit, O oh God. I pray that, Lord, you, uh, because we are your children and we are under the mentorship of the Holy Spirit, help us to identify what our mission is. Help us to identify the purpose to which you called us here. Help us to know that we are not here by mistake. We are here because you're calling us for such a time as this to rise up and to be kingdom, wealthy kingdom ambassadors in Jesus' name. And so I pray for every discouraged person here, for every person that they f who feels they are confused about what their mission is. Holy Spirit of God, I pray that you're going to clarify this for us. You're going to clarify for every person who is under the sound of my voice. Clarify to them what you have called them to do here, Lord. I pray, King of all glory, that you're going to open up the floodgates of heaven. I speak kingdom abundance in the name of Jesus. In every family represented here today, in every individual's life, my God, I pray in the name of Jesus that because you are a God of excellence, we are going to be excellent in our missions and in our money management. Because you are a God who came so that we can have life and have it in abundance, I declare and decree that kingdom abundance is the portion of everyone who's watching here today. Thank you for teaching us that we need to pursue kingdom kingdom wealth so that we can be able to push kingdom agenda. We bless your name and we honor you. I pray king of all glory that you continue perfecting all things that concern us. Above all king of all glory I pray that every person under the sound of my voice will get to that place King Jesus where we will hear you say welcome good and faithful servant. We love you and we honor you from the bottom of our hearts. Thank you for what you have been doing for us um, during this whole conference. We thank you, we adore you and we know that um, this is all for your glory, and you're going to do exceedingly abundantly above and beyond what we expect. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.